This is episode 50 of Vaulting Toward Zion, our jubilee episode, if you will. Greg and Brian and I are here, and in addition, we have some special guests. We have Kate. Kate is married to Greg, and she's a great Bible, English, and history teacher in her own right. Often when we record, she is listening in and cracking jokes in the background, which is just delightful. So it's great to finally have you officially on the show, Kate. It's great to be here. Also with us today are my friends Sam and Laura Negus, who, if Instagram is to be believed, lead an idyllic life of bookish outdoorsiness in the mountains of the American Southeast with their lovely daughter and a puppy who is too cute to be real. Is that about accurate? More or less. Com- that is a completely manicured image. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yes, yeah, so I am a uh, heavily overworked recently laid off failed academic who's just <laughs> trying to get by so that's, <laughs> that's the stuff i don't put on instagram the puppy's cute though <laughs> the puppy is that he's real yeah he's real so so is the child yes <laughs> Great. well laura is an artist and a librarian and sam as you mentioned is a former academic i was fortunate to take a couple of his classes at hillsdale a few years ago Um, So today we're talking about education and discipleship. Um, And to start by way of introductions, why don't we begin by sort of outlining where we are currently as far as roles in that space. That's kind of a very DC way of putting it, of the space that you work in. Nobody says what they actually do in DC. They're just like, oh, I work in the education policy space. It's like, sure, sure you do. Mm. Anyway, so... Um, in education and discipleship, all y'all are parents. So that's one thing. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But in addition, uh, let's start with Sam and Laura. Where, where are you currently? What are you up to? I can go first. So as of at end of February of 2019, of 2020, right? Just this past right year, I took um, a position at my church of director of children's ministry which focuses on um, catechesis of children from preschool through elementary. And so that has been a real expansion of discipleship and teaching um, in addition to parenting. And then I also have a small music teaching role at the school where Joy is. Like once a week teach basic music to all of the students. Just basics of like music notation and rhythm and singing together right singing so that that's been really fun so i have sung in choirs for many years but i've never done like actual instruction so it's it's new but it's it's a lot of fun very cool and what kind of church is this it is um, an anglican church wonderful Mm -hmm. here in in north carolina redeemer uh in anglican Mm -hmm. great cool sam uh yeah so i we have a Christian classical school. The easiest way of describing it is to say that it's attached to the church, but that's not actually correct. Oh. It, it was started, the chairman of the board and the person who started the school is also the rector of our church. And the school meets in the other half of the building that the church occupies, which makes it feel like a parochial school, but it, it, it actually isn't. It's independent. It's ecumenical. Actually, most of the families in the school don't go to our church. Though there are a lot of families in our church that do have their kids in the school, so it's it's it has a real kind of communitarian feel to it, especially for us. So I, I teach classes in the morning in the high school, which is nice for a lot of reasons. Uh, there are only four students in the high school, so it's very <laughs> intimate. And if I go through a fire door and walk up a hallway, about 30 yards I'm at Laura's office in the church um and so it and Joy is downstairs in first grade uh and we just live you know a mile away and we we ride up there on our bikes and you know it 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 feels like a very small and nicely integrated world and uh, we kind of get a a small and nicely integrated paycheck for doing it so (laughs) a small paycheck that's easily integrated into our debts i suppose would be the best Uh, so yeah anyway i'm sure this roundtable isn't about 
griping about how little money there is in doing education the right way, but it'll probably come up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think so. What classes do you teach, Sam? So I teach uh, Christian and classical studies, uh, American government, and world history, but uh, basically anything in the humanities, but particularly history and government. Wonderful. Okay. So, hi. Yes, I um, I kind of slipped into teaching, sort of, sort of with some purpose, but not really. I had always wanted to be a teacher, so I, my, my parents were a little wary of the traditional college scene, so I ended up starting to work at the school that Emily and Brian and David graduated from. When I was 17 years old, I was hired as an apprentice, so I was as old as some of as the seniors there, and there was only about maybe 60 kids in K through 11 or something like that, and um, I couldn't even drive. I had to get hitch a ride with the church, uh, with the school secretary to get there. But I ended up um, working for a couple of years as an aide and kind of dipping my, my feet wet. And there I met my husband. He was cajoled by our headmaster to come down and teach uh, after having taught a pretty full career in, nor- in the northern part of California in Anderson. And then uh, we had children. We had three beautiful girls and I went back to school to get my my English degree and the school tapped me again and said, please come back. But all of the teaching I had been doing in the interim time had been primarily with mom and uh, mom and daughter clubs Hmm. and both associated with the school and also with our church. A lot of, um, a lot of lady studies, Bible studies for young women. And now I'm currently uh, a junior high homeroom teacher. I have about, 30 students in my uh, Bible class and then, you know, 17 or 18 in the other classes that I teach. And I also teach high school American literature. So it's been a real blessing. I have some other duties that uh, people have tried to pawn off on me at the school. Cause when you have a small school, as you guys probably know, uh, everybody does a little bit of everything in order to make it work. And yeah. like your school cornerstone is independent. Um, so my Bible class represents roughly 15, 15 to 20 different churches just in that one classroom that I have. So, And many of them range from what we consider Pentecostal to Baptist to Presbyterian to Reformed. So it's a really broad... Wait, I don't have any Anglicans. That's sad. I, I'd like to collect some. That'd be fun to have in the class. <laughs> But they might not change the dynamic much since they'd probably just sit there and, and just agree with everybody. <laughs> like, that seems fine. That's fine. That seems great. Yeah. It, I, I have uh, just in, in, my, in one of my classes of three underclassmen, I, I, I have one student is a, her father was a Mennonite pastor and is, and they're now Anglicans. And another one, another student is a, Seventh Day Adventist, so yeah, uh, it's a variety, ecumenical, mm-hmm. yeah, and it, that mm-hmm. is kind of one of the surprising things is is the students who come to classical schools, and mm-hmm. um, you know, you, you those of us who are kind of really involved in the project assume that everybody else who buys in at, at, at a level sufficiently committed to have their child in the school must fully get what it is you're doing <laughs> and so it's like true. you're right the truth is they they maybe they there's maybe one thing that they like yes. and they're all there for a different one thing you're like okay all right right, <laughs> Let's right. see what we can do not that that is necessarily ecumenicism and 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 that dynamic aren't necessarily the same thing but i think they they do overlap right because the, where yeah. you choose to go to church generally points towards what it is that you value mm-hmm. the most and yeah. what it is that you value the most is going to dictate what it is that you see of value right. in, a, in a school but anyway right i think there's cultural things that happen to go along with that our school has had a tremendous shift in the last how long would you say it's been greg mm-hmm. maybe seven ten years, years mm-hmm. ten, 10 years, years give or take. where we have a tremendous um, a number of slavic students that have come uh, whose parents are 
many of them had immigrated as young people and teenagers or, or some of them came as children. But I have a lot of students whose parents don't speak English or much English or their grandparents aren't even coming, aren't even in America yet. And they they all kind of tend to say the same thing. They want they want something that's that's they get to a point. Many of them come in junior high, high school, because mm-hmm. they're fine with their kids in a public school setting. Until they get to junior high, they start to see the clash of culturally what they've taught their kids and then what their peer groups are doing at school. So they want to have a good Christian environment for their kids, mm-hmm. but without necessarily understanding all the implications of what it means to have a Christian world in life view. So we'll get people that are just are, don't want their kids to swear and do drugs and, <laughs> and all that. But that's the Christian education is so much more than just, you know, abstaining from these, these sort of negative behaviors. Yeah. Well, if you have me as your teacher, it's actually slightly less than that as well. That's <laughs> <laughs> another right. story. Uh, well, mm. <laughs> Not the drugs. I've never done drugs. Uh, I have occasionally I may have let, said a let a foul word, word pass my lips. To myself in class. <laughs> Junior hires like it if I slip. Well, you know, whenever you say, don't tell your parents I said that, that's the first thing they go home and tell their parents, of course. Uh, I'm sure you probably heard me say that a couple times, Emily. Okay, guys. Let's Uh, not do this. That happened in in school on uh, Tuesday. Oh, boy. (laughs) boy. uh, Don't tell your parents I was encouraging you to watch South Park. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Greg, how did you get into teaching? Uh, I grew up in Christian schools, sort of the same school going through a number of changes along the way, first as a church school, then as an independent school. My, the man who taught me my last four years was my pastor, wonderful, remarkable man who knew a lot about a lot and impressed upon me how fun and interesting and exciting being a teacher could be. And yet that wasn't really what did it. I went to, uh, I went to the local junior college and started as a physics major and found out I hated it, Um, but was far enough in not to quit. But I realized one reason I hated it is because I'd had no science training to speak of in my Christian school. And I thought, hmm, Hmm. Christian schools need to teach the sciences and and higher mathematics. So maybe there's something there. And so I continued on and got a secondary uh, teaching major in in physics and, and math. And then went back to the school I graduated from. And stayed there until it closed, as it too went. Again, went through multiple shifts. Uh, and then when it closed, um, headmaster of our current school, he'd been after me for a couple of years, invited me to come down and teach high school. So I did. Now, along the way, even while I was in high school, I read a lot. I read books on theology. Because at some point, a particular gentleman said, oh, you, that, look, that book looks interesting. Why don't you take it home and read it? A little pamphlet on eschatology. So I did, and I came back, and he said, oh, you like that? Here, read this, Bedner's Millennium. Okay, I came back, and oh, here, read this, Hendrickson's Commentary on Revelation. Oh, here, read the Robert Campbell on the new Co- Israel and the New Covenant. I, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to be able to understand theology at 14. Mm-hmm. And this guy just kept pushing books at me, you know, sending me to listen to theological tapes. And so I, I learned about the creeds and confessions of the church beyond what my pastor had taught me, and I learned the Bible pretty thoroughly. I read the Bible a lot. I listened to a lot of Christian radio where I heard the Bible a lot. You see a theme here? <laughs> um, and when I went back into the classroom, I understood a couple things. Well, one, I, I had Christian education modeled for me by someone who understood theology well, Reformed theology. But as I went back in, I understood that I am discipling young people to Christ. Now, most of our kids in that school were from covenant homes, from covenant children, baptized, grew up in Sunday school or confirmation class or something, but many weren't. But, you know, and this this is something I, I maybe we can come back to, but I want to say it at least once, the need of every human soul is the same. We need to repent of our sins and believe in Jesus. And in that, we receive two things. We receive the forgiveness of sins. That's a, a legal transaction. We talk about justification by faith. And we need... Our hearts change. We need the gift of the Holy Spirit in order to be and do what God has already decreed legally that we are. And so at any point and every point through the years, I've tried to assume in my work with young people 
and in my classes, in my curriculum, a lot of which I've written, that this is basic. The creator, triune God of Scripture, who speaks infallibly, inherently, authoritatively, in terms of covenant, to a fallen humanity, redeemed, whose covenant members, who's the elect, have been redeemed by Christ, and justified by faith, or will be at some point in their lives, which may not be yet, and um, will be sanctified by his spirit. Now, that has profound implications for classroom discipline. And it, mm -hmm. my purpose here tonight is largely to say, I think, just what I said. Uh, if you're, if you're mm -hmm. new to this uh, podcast, you need to go back and listen to the last <laughs> 49 episodes, because I don't intend to repeat all of that we've been saying. But I'd like to hear what these people have to say. I assume that our theology is more or less to this point identical or at least extremely similar, though we come from different traditions. We want to point people to Jesus. We want to assume the Bible's true. Yeah. I say, what? It'd be nice if we always did that, wouldn't it? <laughs> but we don't always because we're sinners too. And so we come to the classroom mm -hmm. not as glorified saints who drip with divine wisdom, but as sinners justified by faith and dwelled by the Spirit who are trying to help other sinners who are a little younger and more naive, less experienced, to walk with Jesus and to do it in the full range of curriculum. We can talk about Christian worldview and all that. So that's how I got to be where I am. I've been doing it for a long time. I don't have impressive credentials. Uh, I wish I did sometimes. It's nice. I admire impressive credentials. I admire people who have labored in particular fields to uh, get the, the master's, the PhD or something like that. We need that very much so. I'm all in favor of academics. I'm just not one of them. I'm a classroom teacher. I'm a Bible teacher. And that's where God's called me. So that's where I am at the moment. You can have my credentials if you want. I'll trade them to you for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> give me 10 years back and I'll give you my credentials. <laughs> <laughs> who's, who's Brian? Hello. Is, is he supposed Hello, to Brian. be his call? <laughs> <laughs> He's just being very He's quiet just sort of right lurking now. over there. Brian is our good buddy. Do you want to introduce yourself, Brian? Yeah, of course. Uh, I, I'm Brian. I went to school with uh, with David, uh, and I didn't technically go to school with Emily because she only joined the school after I'd left. Yeah. Uh, after David and I had left, as a matter of fact, she was trying to avoid us, and she <laughs> succeeded. Absolutely. And then she went and married David. It was kind of like, uh, you, you blew all of the effort that you went through. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been, uh, I, I was at Cornerstone, uh, the school where Greg uh, teaches now for eight years, something like that. So Maybe you were seven. thoroughly indoctrinated. Yes. Um, it might be useful, Brian, to explain real fast your past theological background. Yes, the nature oh. of your indoctrination. Oh, uh, <laughs> yes, the nature of yes. it. So I was, I was actually raised uh, Word of Faith Pentecostal, and uh, that is no longer what I am, uh, clearly. <laughs> 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 and uh you know sort of started this slow migration towards uh reformed theology through junior high and high school and now i go to an opc here in uh the sacramento area yeah i mean i'm i think i'm kind of similar to greg i don't have fancy credentials but i read a lot and Brian does read I'm, so much like every time i go on goodreads there's a new update from brian and i'm like dude Slow down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the problem is that most of those are audiobooks of uh, fic <laughs> fiction, uh, so it's not even so, not, man. Yes, I, I I still have a, a healthy amount on my theology shelf that I need to read <laughs> for the first time. But I love I do love reading. I love theology, and um, most of the time when I I used to listen more frequently to podcasts, I got sidetracked by all the audiobooks I've been listening to. But I, I used to listen to a whole slew of different theology podcasts, and I would just like try to absorb everything about uh, classical Christian theism, about Reformed theology, about um, the historical witness for the reliability of the Gospels, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Just anything you could name, I was just like, okay, I want to, I want to eat it and and make it a mm -hmm. part of my brain, and I will, I will do this, and I think I've gotten there somewhat at least. <laughs> Time to teach it, Brian. Yeah. Brian is one of these people that I think right. should really, by all rights, be a teacher. So. What do you do for a living, Brian? Uh, well, at the moment, I'm not doing anything for a living. I'm looking for work. 
and trying to move out of state at the same time because I, I do live in the um, Communist Republic of California. Hi. And <laughs> I, I know you do, Kate. I <laughs> right, right. Where but it's not it, easy to be a Christian school. That's true. Yeah. But I, I'm more drawn at least by inclination towards marketing so that that's that's my kind of field of interest and you have that's what you've been doing that. right yeah uh, a little bit i i was doing sales most recently okay. which mm-hmm. was not fun i don't i don't like sales <laughs> very much <laughs> so if you could market to the california government the great need for independent christian schools I think marketing presupposes a more or less rational comprehension of one's prime needs <laughs> is the problem with pitching anything to the government of California. Right. Or any government, Fair. honestly. Uh. Right. <laughs> so that's me. I want to I wanna touch on or jump off of something you touched on, Greg. It's that classroom discipline looks different for a Christian school. Um, and I'm curious to um, hear... All y'all's perspective on that is, especially as we have so many different uh, grade levels represented and situations. Mm-hmm. Kate, why don't you go first? Oh, okay. Um, I wish I could say I had like some kind of magic training on how to how to discipline my classroom. <laughs> I I am perfectly placed in junior high because. I am what my kids call either chaotic neutral or chaotic good. Um, so I'm a very chaotic person, kind mm-hmm. of like the the junior hires that I teach. Mm-hmm. Uh, but one of the things that was uh, remarkable about the school when I first started working there is that I had a teacher who was to be my mentor. And she probably spent more time ministering to the kids the gospel than she did actually teaching them anything, which <laughs> kind of did – create some problems when, you know, she was having a real heart to heart with a kid on the playground and the spelling lesson was languishing up in the classroom. And Mm -hmm. I had 15 kids and I didn't know what to do with them. So I just started teaching. But the things that I have learned, if I had to distill them, is the, the first thing is that I think we have to assume that kids are real people. So often I think that we don't assume that they're little that there are little people with souls that have a Mm. direct relationship to God. And Mm. when kids, when, um, when they're told to, to look only at things as this is good or this is bad. I, I think that can create a lot of problems for little kids because, you know, they're told to, you know, sit still in the classroom, raise your hand, do this, do that. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do that to the kid next to you. Don't do that to the kid in line. Um, and of course, if they're not taught why, these things just become rules that are empty and uh, either something to slavishly chain yourself to or something to purposely break all the time. Mm. So one of the most significant things that I ended up walking away with was just recognizing that each of my students has a relationship with God. And my job is to, first of all, my, I believe my first my first thing is I'm hired to actually be a teacher, so I must teach them something. <laughs> but, but I feel like one of the things that God has called me to do is to do what I can to, to reach their heart and to provoke that, that um, understanding of who they are and their relationship to God. Now, this is where, this is where a lot of the, where I had some issues with the teacher that was my mentor because she very much was in um was very much a kind of a baptistic i guess maybe you would say arminian kind of uh, bent toward her and just about every other class was like an altar call <laughs> which is not necessarily bad i think those there's a place for those but uh when you're dealing with a with a whole stack of kids i think it's a mistake to think that they're either all rank unbelievers or that they are all Christians. So my main goal is to always share the gospel with them, which is the thing that both believers and unbelievers need to hear, that there's new life Mm -hmm. in Christ, that there's real forgiveness of our sins, and there's a real way to be right with God and live in a way that pleases Him and brings joy to you. Mm -hmm. Uh, But one of the things that um, I really felt convicted about when I was, especially when I got to junior high, 
is that idea that that if guilting kids into doing the right thing, mm. you know, we don't I, like punishing them to do something um, or you know, given like 20 stacks of demerits, I don't know what your school uses to, for, to curb naughtiness, but we, we've done all sorts of things, um, from using the rod, which we don't use much anymore to uh, lines, to sweeping the parking lot. Did you ever have to do that, Brian? Did you ever have to sweep the parking lot for Mr. Garvey? (laughs) No, I don't think I ever did. (laughs) Yeah. Some kids had to do that. And it was, it was a very futile task. Um, but, but to understand that these kids, you know, what they've done in the classroom is not being naughty. What they've done is sin. And if I can show them there's a remedy for sin in Christ, mm. then it does make a difference when you have mm. this long-term relationship and you're building with the kid. Because if they truly have come to Christ, then I'm talking about them with something completely different. They don't have to obey these rules to get me to like them. They don't have to obey these rules to be, you know, be in my classroom what they're doing, what they're doing is growing in Christ, you know, and, and trusting him, going to him when they sin, mm-hmm. calling out to him when they need fresh grace for the moment to be obedient. Mm-hmm. But it's a, it's a huge mistake to think that our kids do not have souls. And I feel so frequently that people just think that they don't have a real relationship with God mm-hmm. and that they can't feel the power and the guilt of their own sin and that they are many times desperately crying out for the remedy of their sin. And we don't give it to them because we give them rules or Mm. right ways of behavior. So that's the first place that I usually want to start. But of course I have some practical things I do to run my classroom, but Mm. I don't, I think if we don't start there, then the rest is um, creates either Pharisees or libertines. (laughs) Mm. So when you say, um, you know, when they break a classroom, uh, rule or something. It's not just that they've been naughty, it's that they've sinned. Is there a tension there between recognizing that these are sometimes rebellious humans and knowing that you don't necessarily know their heart and it's not... How do you make sure that it is the law of God that's judging them rather than bringing down harsh rules of the classroom? (laughs) Right. Um, Well, I would say that the fewer the rule, the fewer rules you have, the better. I think that you should have very few rules in your classroom. And if you look at my classroom rules, um, I have about ten. And there's a reason why there's about ten, <laughs> and you probably can guess why there's about ten of them. Um, they all tend to be the positive, the, the positive uh, aspects of the Ten Commandments, actually. Mm-hmm. So of course, yeah, I need to keep order in my class. But, you know, you tend to have some, some – every kid is in a different place spiritually. And so some are going to be very tender to your mm-hmm. exhortations with regard to Scripture. And some are just going to be little pistols. Mm-hmm. And um, mm-hmm. you do have to you do have to give them consequences for their sin. Uh, but the thing is, is that if I, I as a teacher have to make sure that the things that I'm requiring in my classroom are, first of all, consistent, consistent in the worldview of the classroom, right, if that makes sense. And that there's something that I'm willing to enforce every time and that they are, they're not my own personal whims, but that I can go straight back to what the scripture has said and say, no, this is, this is where I'm, this is where I'm basing how we're going to treat one another in the classroom. Even Mm -hmm. if it's just as basic as love your neighbor as yourself. Every teacher though has different levels of what's acceptable in his or her classroom. So I had, I have had students who, well, for instance, I'll just use my own class as an example. I don't require my students to raise their hands. And that goes against the grain of like the younger grade teachers, like the fifth grade Mm -hmm. teacher. She walked into my classroom. She'd be like, this is the wow, wow West because (laughs) there's like people are calling out, they're talking over each other and everything. And, and I do that pretty, pretty intentionally, which I can share with you some other time. But there's a there's a way that we do it, and I had to teach them and instruct them, and it ultimately mm-hmm. came back down to um, we're creating a safe learning environment for mm-hmm. everyone, and that means that you must exercise self control. Mm-hmm. What does that look like? That's hard. That's mm-hmm. challenging. But there's no better opportunity to do that mm-hmm. I've found than removing that that kindergarten rule of raise your hand or walk in a straight line or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Laura, you look like you have thoughts. Oh, I was just absorbing. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, To be honest, I don't have a lot of hands on. I I mean, I do have my in the music classes, but I, I see the students. I think I have only taught three lessons so far because the school like didn't have any specials for the first quarter because of COVID restrictions. And, Uh, mm -hmm. and so Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm still like getting to know the kids and in my music classes. And then my role in children's ministry has, it began like immediately before all of the quarantine things. And so I also haven't had very much, (laughs) um, hands-on things. So, but you have a daughter. I was going to say she has a lot of hands-on experience of discipline with one child. <laughs> so it's not a very true. large data set. That is true. Uh, it's not a very wide data set, but it is a it yeah. is a very voluminous sample size of a single kind. <laughs> no, I was really en- enjoying absorbing these. I mm. I don't think very consciously about about these things a lot. Of, like I need to about well like, like shepherding the heart of the child. Um, I think some of it is subconscious, but I think a lot of times um, I'm feeling convicted now because I, I do just kind of want to correct the behavior and, and joy in particular is the type of child that, that um, falls in line with rules well. And so it's been, that, that's been, yeah, I need to reevaluate some of these things. We have three daughters <laughs> and our oldest is very much a rule keeper. And she was very, very much wanted to do the right thing. Um, And then then God gave us child number two. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, uh, Not saying we have it perfect, that's for sure. But one of the things that I, just to encourage, you know, everybody with is that all these these discipleship things that we're talking about is it's a lifelong discipling, mm-hmm. which I think is one reason why um, Paul tells Titus that the older women must teach the younger women, and it, the older women learn a lot through teaching. Which is, I'm not equating you, Brian, to an older woman, but what I'm telling <laughs> you is that the best way to to learn something for yourself <laughs> is to have to teach it to somebody else. Yeah, yeah, and. Um, and it, it kind of distills it down to the, its most basic component parts, and you understand it so much better. So, you know, perhaps the Lord will give you one day a teaching opportunity. Or but lots I of think children. That's, well, yeah, or wow. lots of kids. I, I really mm-hmm. wasn't expecting that pivot to happen at that particular <laughs> point of the verse. Wow. Right, right. So, um, something I wanted to, to point out, and, you know, just for – to remind everyone who's listening and for everyone else's benefit, I don't have children and I'm not a teacher. So like I'm, I should be the one asking questions, but I feel like I need, I want to say something, so I'm going to do it. Yeah. Um, That's why I told you to interrupt, Brian. <laughs> Didn't you yeah. remember that? Shh, 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 shh. <laughs> uh, one, one of the things that uh, you said, Kate, that kind of jogged my memory was about this, uh, this idea of, you know, having too many rules. And if you, if you do that, you know, you're, you're basically walking this, razor's edge between turning people into Pharisees or into libertines. And that's, Mm. that's the thing that jogged my memory. It's like, how often do you hear from people who were raised in stricter home environments, for instance, that, you know, they thought that their ability to keep these rules was something that kept them in better spiritual discipline with God Mm, and was like a proof of their own salvation and Very true. how how often do we stop to think about uh, the way that we present rules and the way that we make these distinctions between this rule exists because I have been placed in authority over you by God, but the rule itself is not in and of itself something that determines your status with God. That's right. Very true. And I, I see that the kids that have struggled the most in my class with rules, because there are kids and they do they, that struggle for a number of reasons. You know, it could be just they, they're not getting enough sleep or they're just, you know, particularly mm-hmm. hyper or they may have had a diagnosed issue like ADHD. How how terrible and how um, completely demoralizing it is. For them to look at themselves and go, God hates me. God doesn't love me. I'm no good to anyone because mm-hmm. I can't keep these rules. That's such a 
terrible place for a young person mm-hmm. to be. Um, and that is one reason why the gospel has to be front and center mm-hmm. with the things that we tell the kids. Hey, buddy, no one gets to keep the rules. We can't. But they're not there for us to keep so that God will like us mm-hmm. if they have a completely different purpose. And so just this week, I was teaching the Ten Commandments to my students in their Bible class. We're, we're going through the uh, histories of the Old Testament. And um, it was what they wanted to talk about more than anything were the positive practical applications of the law hmm. because, and, and many of them were from churches. I, I had them raise their hands. I had them ask, I asked them how many of you, your, your churches read the 10 commandments on a regular basis. No hands went up. How many of you have had them read in the last year at church? No hands went up. How many of you have read them on your own at all? No hands went up. This is this is the transcript of God's character, and it's not there for us to be saying oh, we have to do all these things and live. It's what Christ accomplished for us, and that's what young people need to see, that Christ accomplished these things for them, and that by true faith and in, in believing in the promises of Scripture and what Jesus has done for us, they too can be partaker, partakers of these promises. And that's for little kids, that Jesus mm-hmm. says, mm-hmm. suffer them to come to me. Um, I don't want to be a stumbling block to any little kid because of the rules that I make for my classroom. This is not to say I don't have rules. I do. Mm -hmm. But, um, but they're not there to create perfect little automatons that are, that exist for my own convenience. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think a lot of rules tend to. Mm -hmm. It's for my convenience or so that I can feel in control of Mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. And uh, my Mm -hmm. job is not to control. It's to shepherd. Mm-hmm. Well, not not that this is exactly what this particular episode of this podcast is about, but that point about you know how many of you have read or heard the Ten Commandments this year is exactly what liturgy is for. Yes. And oh, in in Cramner's <laughs> prayer book, Amen. Eucharist liturgy, uh, before you come to the table, <laughs> uh, you, you read the Decalogue collectively and you recite each of the Ten Commandments followed by uh, Lord, incline our hearts to keep this law. And That's then after right. the 10th, Lord, incline our hearts to keep this law and write all these thy laws on our hearts, we beseech thee. Yes. And you don't say it because you're in the mood. <laughs> no. uh, right. you, you say it because you need to hear it. Right. Um, it's actually one of my not very many pet peeves about our current parish, which I love very much, but we never include the Decalogue um, mm. in our mm. Eucharist liturgy. We just say the the twofold summary of the law, love thy neighbor as thyself and all uh, that, you know, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart or whatever. Uh, you know, that's, that's good. Um, on these two hang uh, all the law and the prophets, but uh, you know, it is nice to be, to be specific. And, um, you <laughs> know, God I, was. I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I think um, this is something that Laura and I talk about a great deal we both believe very passionately that liturgy is good for children, uh, Mm -hmm. whereas our culture thinks exactly the opposite. Mm, We have a cultural predisposition to think that if it's routine and boring, um, if it's the same, it's boring. And if it's boring, Mm -hmm. the kids won't like it. Uh, (laughs) Whereas at least little kids, that's exactly what they want Mm. is to know how things are supposed to be. Uh, And really that's in, in micro scale, that's what classical education is. Mm-hmm. Classical education mm-hmm. is a manifold, diverse and complex, but still cohesive and in some sense kind of unitary, uh, or at least unified, if not unitary, story. And eventually you'll figure out how, you know, what your place in this story is. Mm-hmm. It, it's, a, it's a cultural and spiritual heritage that's being handed down to you and you fit in at, at, at this end part or maybe not the end. I don't want to trigger Brian, but um, <laughs> you, you fit in uh, at the part that we're currently at right? <laughs> and maybe it's the end or maybe it's not, who knows? <laughs> uh, but, you know, as far as, as far as classroom discipline goes, uh, you know, I think that what, um, Kate was saying about you know the gospel and souls is is good um I think that uh, is a a, a kind of related principle that Laura and I have always talked about and has been important to us and is one of the things that my my parents always talked about 
Um, I know it's always easy to fixate on the the parts of your parents' parenting philosophy that were crap because they stand out more obviously <laughs> to you. But one one part of my parents' parenting philosophy that I've appreciated more and more over the years that I, I always remember them saying is, well, you know, every child has a, has its own personality and you can't really do do very much about it, right? You have to parent the actual children that you were given. Right. Yes. And, and recognizing that they have their own personality is an important beginning of recognizing that they are their own independent moral agents before god yes and as far as classroom discipline goes you know i I think my uh, my approach is uh similar to kate's um i i wouldn't class myself as a libertine uh but as emily can testify (laughs) most of my instincts are thoroughgoingly libertarian (laughs) Um, and so uh, you know, I, I, I don't, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I got in, I got into an argument, a uh, pretty fierce, short and fierce argument with a company, uh, police officer this week, oh. um, which, oh, uh, in my defense, he started, but I wasn't going <laughs> oh, to back boy, down, oh, um, <laughs> because he got my libertarian hackles up by telling me that something was none of my business when I asked him a question. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't really care much for authority figures and consequently I don't, I don't really want to be one. Um, but I do when I have to, and when I have to is when the thing that we're in the classroom to do doesn't get done. You know, I I think the difference between an authoritarian and a libertarian is that an, an, uh, an authoritarian wants the rules to be obeyed because he egotistically thinks of the rules as a projection of himself Mm -hmm. and and a libertarian doesn't care. (laughs) <laughs> you know, a, a libertarian doesn't care whether you like him or not. Um, Wouldn't you love to might... be in California right now? No. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's easy. There's the never immediacy of that answer. To be in California. <laughs> you, yeah, you would just die. Uh, yeah. No, God bless you all. God bless each and every one of you. Um, so, uh, no, if you like, I can I can soothe your soul by pulling some of my guns out of the closet and showing you via Skype. But you'll probably get arrested for being on a Skype call with someone who has guns in the closet. But anyway. uh, without um, a mask. You should really have a mask on for me. Yeah. <laughs> and I for you. Yeah. Um, I should put a mask on my guns, maybe. But, uh, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think, I think the, the point is to, to model... Uh, and and this is different because I I only teach older students. I've never taught students mm-hmm. younger than high school. Uh, Modeling is huge. Students. Yeah, but but to model respect for the mm-hmm. thing that you do. That look, I I don't really care whether you respect me in an egotistic sense, right? Like I if mm-hmm. if you if you do what I'm telling you to do just because of the way that you feel about me you know that that's nice but it's it really isn't the point and and I'm not going to insist on it I I don't I don't care if you like me uh, but I but I will get upset if you disrespect this thing that we're in the classroom to do because it's very very important and it has something to offer you and I'm I'm going to show you what it looks like that I am trying to accept what this thing is offering me mm-hmm. and hopefully I make that appealing and um winsome Right. And um, then you have to figure out what that looks like for you. I don't mean to s- sound like uh, it's that's completely relativistic. I'm, I, I don't mean that. What I mean is, the, the, as um, Greg said, right, the, the, the core human need is the same mm-hmm. for everyone. Uh, there isn't a story that's whatever you want to make it. But we're all individuals and we each come to the story and are incorporated in, into the story in a way that's somewhat unique to us. And so the the interacting with understanding where they fall into this great human story uh, of which the gospel is the the central and defining part is individual as well. And if, if, you know, once they get to the, to the age of high school, they're well beyond the point of, internalizing anything because of of external pressures right. they they will only mm-hmm. put a mask on and you won't realize that you that you didn't do the job until it's too late mm-hmm. uh, and so if you can't draw them out and and appeal to their real personality and find how to encourage them to engage with something 
of their own internal drive, you know, you you you'll miss the whole mission of what you're doing. And discipline is a part of that. And that, that's I, I always prefer positive discipline of, you know, encouragement to grasp right. the beautiful thing. Um, mm-hmm. And I, and I, I only go for the for the firm discouragement uh, when it's absolutely necessary to keep the someone from just disrupting the whole group, right? And that's as a, that's kind of a principle. One of my guiding principles is you can silently opt out for yourself if you want to, uh, but but you'll only see my you know as Emily can also attest. If I need to give someone a, a vicious tongue lashing, I can do it, but. That I, that only comes out when I feel that students are jeopardizing the the work that I'm trying to do with and for all of the students. And and I guess the last mm-hmm. thing I would say on this, and this this uh, Laura might have more to say about this or you know any any of the rest of you, but one of the conversations that Laura and I have all the time, and one of the things that frustrates me about about parenting in general, although we don't always do this perfectly, but I think it is one thing that we do probably better than most and i'm sure there are things we do worse than most but this i think is one of the things we we do fairly well at is to continually have conversations about what we want uh joy to be like in the future right and i i, I don't mean that in terms of how can we control her and make sure she becomes the exact person that we have in mind but what's this is the person that she is now at age six this is the intrinsic part of her personality that's never going to change. So what's the ideal, healthy, independent, but still communitarian, godly version of that at age X or age twice X or whatever? What, what, does, this, what does this bad habit look like when she's eight mm-hmm. if we don't check it now? What does this good habit grow into and how do we cultivate that? Mm-hmm. And how do we expect it when she's six? And what does it look like when it's 10 and, and 18 and so on? And, um, you know, if, if, you don't, if you don't have that vision of where you're going, then discipline will be what, what Kate said of, I think, less, you know, less than ideal discipline, which is mm-hmm. aimed at your own convenience. Yeah. Um, and that's it's what we, we talk about this, um, you know, with parents who, aren't fortunate enough to have, as, as my old headmaster always said, the bandwidth to think about those things. Single mm-hmm. parents, you know, parents who yeah. are overworked, parents who don't get the support they need from their partner, yeah. uh, you know, divided families where maybe, maybe the mother gets it and the dad just doesn't or re- more rarely the other way around. Mm-hmm. They're working too many jobs, working too many hours, whatever it may be. And all you have the time and the emotional energy to do is just is just put out fires. Mm. You're being a problem to me right now. I'm going to do this because it'll make the problem go away more immediately. You know, and, right. and you look at that and say, well, look, what you're doing will make that problem worse in 10 years. Mm. And, and nothing can be worse than that. Like you, you can't afford to do it wrong now. Mm. And, and just people don't get that. And I think schools don't get that. Mm-hmm. Agreed. And I think sometimes we have such a narrow and some of the things you said there were so, so profound and important because we have such a narrow vision of what discipline is because we think it's mm-hmm. just smacking down bad behavior mm-hmm. or pointing out good behavior, positive discipline, but it's discipling, mm-hmm. it's teaching, it's con- it, it's constantly modeled for our own children. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's modeled in a million countless ways that are not actually things that we say, but things that we do, uh, mm-hmm. where we spend our time, uh, even how we say things, those things are, are, have profound impact. And as a classroom teacher, you know, I also have a number of friends in the homeschool community. And one of the, one of the reasons why a lot of my homeschool friends want to homeschool is because they want that parental oversight of their children and they feel like Mm -hmm. it's their calling before God. And that's very good. I I do agree with that. But they also think I don't want my kid necessarily influenced by people that are not me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And uh, I, I have two objections to that. One is that we all live in community and God gave our children to us and we have a responsibility, but we also, so do every other adult in their lives as well. I want lots of godly people speaking into the lives of my own children. Mm-hmm. But the but the other thing is to think that 
the school can undo what the home does. Mm -hmm. And it is very, very unusual for that to happen Mm -hmm. because it's so the home is such a profound influence on young people. They say Mm -hmm. the first five years, right? Uh, It is almost impossible to undo the behavior patterns, uh, the thinking patterns that that the children bring with them to the classroom, despite mm-hmm. our good teaching. And even though what we're saying is is good and right, uh, it's really hard to necessarily say, well, I'm going to now mold you after this particular fashion. What the children bring to school with them is who they are. And we kind of have to work with that. We don't have, a, we don't have the option to um, yeah. make them after our own image. Yeah, I think the latter of those two points is something that uh, Emily wanted to talk about in a bit with regards to what what we wish um, <laughs> parents maybe knew or got that they don't know or don't get. But the the former uh, is um, it, important as well. Um, and I'm I'm not really one to cite social science as evidence for anything because I think it's mostly a pile of poo. But um, <laughs> it, it studies do consistently show that when you look at people who were raised in Christian homes like we all were, as far as I can tell, um, and who are continuing to be professing Christians in adulthood, as we all are, that one of the consistent factors is that they had um, influences in their life who were not their parents, who Mm -hmm. told them the same things their parents did, Mm -hmm. and they made personal connections with those people. You know, yeah. I'll, I'll um, you know, when I was young, I, I, I grew up in a brethren assembly and um, I, I don't know why one Sunday I just started sitting next to uh, where I grew up in a really tight knit brethren assembly where everybody was uncle and auntie. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, this this great, very devout, godly man, uh, John Grice who was one of the elders at the church, he always, always handed out the hymn books on the, uh, to everyone on the way in on Sunday morning. And I just started sitting next to him one Sunday for no particular reason. He didn't have any children of his own. Um, and um, he and his wife just kind of, uh, you know, a- adopted me as, as their, uh, a surrogate child, I guess, in the, in the assembly for years. And, um, you know, he was a big, and he wasn't the only one, but there, there, there were lots. Um, but, um, you know, it, it those those kinds of influences where you know children have people to look up to and respect and revere and and to think that when they do right, they're not just receiving the approval of of God, who is a, a kind of disembodied. Well, sorry, obviously God is not disembodied. <laughs> it's the, Second person of the Trinity is eternally embodied, resurrected, uh, yeah, etc. Anyway, you know what I mean, right? This this kind of unseen idea of God, the the unseen idea of God's affirmation or disapprobation, comes to us primarily embodied in the people in our communities. And if that's only your parents, the likelihood of that breaking down at a certain point is quite high. Uh, Mm -hmm. But if it's a whole crowd of other people, the likelihood of it breaking down is very low. Mm -hmm. Um, And and schools aren't the only way of achieving that, but they can be a very important part. Uh, I think they shouldn't be the only part, but they are Mm -hmm. are possibly a very important avenue to that. Yeah. Well, the local congregation should be filling that role. And when we Mm -hmm. push our children off into children's churches or... Mm-hmm. other kinds of ministry because they're not old enough to understand what the big people are doing. We're yeah. cutting a spiritual lifeline. They, do, yeah. they Kids need to do exactly what happened to you. They need to sit by other believers now and then. They need to talk mm-hmm. to them. They need to talk to adults, not just their own peer group. They they need uh, instruction. They need prayers. They need to know, I can go up to her and she'll give me wise counsel and she'll pray for me right now. Mm-hmm. As a matter of course, mm-hmm. not as some special, wow, mom, guess what happened today? And when this happens, you're, you're, you're so right. It, it just builds on what the family's doing. Families should not be afraid of this. They should embrace this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think good parents, too. I think they understand. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, Sam, you alluded earlier to the uh, slim pay that uh, Christian schools have a reputation for 
giving to their teachers. Um, but there's this paradox of like, teachers don't get paid very much in Christian schools, but the tuition seems like such a burden to a lot of families. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So maybe this is a little bit of a personal finance question, but knowing how expensive Christian schools can be, especially if you have multiple children, what do you prioritize as a parent and as a teacher? And how do you, how do you plan for those challenges? Yeah, you know, I think I think Greg and Kate have it sounds like been in the exact same situation, which is uh, that we're in, which is being both parents and teachers in the same school, right? So, you know, my daughter goes to a school that I love, which costs us five hundred dollars a month, uh, which is actually mostly covered by an opportunity scholarship in the state of North Carolina. So it basically costs us nothing. Yeah. Yay! My daughter goes <laughs> to school for free. But I also kind of work there for basically free. Um, so, you know, boo. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's difficult. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know that I have the answer. I don't, I don't have a simple answer. Uh, well, actually, I do have a simple answer, but it's also hard to achieve. Simplicity and hardness are not the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I, it, it, I mean, the... the the answer would be, um, and this I'm going to give give away uh, how much Rod Dre and me and Laura read. Um, <laughs> the, the answer would be for us to do what what the Hasidic Jews do, uh, which is to throw all of our community resources at making sure that we have schools that teach our children what they need to learn, mm. regardless of whether we personally have children in the schools or not. Mm. Um, I, and, and obviously my perspective is colored by the fact that this is something I'm personally engaged in. Yeah. Um, but still, I, I don't understand how, uh, at this point in time, serious Christians cannot understand that schools that will teach a, a faithful, coherent, cohesive gospel worldview and Christian life and, you know, preserve the heritage of the true faith once delivered in our cultural time and place for our children mm -hmm. is the single most important thing that we collectively can do. And mm -hmm. you don't individually have to be that rich as a community to sustain that well. Mm -hmm. If if the school is run only on the money of the parents, like you know, you might have children in school for ten years of your working life, or well, it would hopefully be slightly more than ten. Okay, fifteen. Let's say you have two kids; one mm -hmm. of them's three years older than the other. You're going to have children in school for fifteen years of your working life. So if you only give money to a Christian school for those two children during those 15 yeah. years, the cost will be immense, right? But if, if we were all giving money to our Christian schools through all of the period of our life that we could afford to give money, and we all did it regardless of how many children we had and, and whether they were not yet old mm -hmm. enough to be in school or they graduated years ago, Right, and if we bequeathed our money to these schools in our wills, um, right. that would look very differently. Right, how you organize that, I I don't know. Um, someone with a vision for this who knows a lot of rich and powerful people, <laughs> um, like some kind of Larry P. Arn of the Christian <laughs> classical school world, needs to convince a lot of wealthy, blue-haired old ladies that giving money to the fund for classical Christian education is the way that they can preserve everything that they care about after they're dead and put together some immense endowment to mm -hmm. help these schools. You know, like I said, that's a simple answer, but it's, it's also very difficult to achieve in mm -hmm. terms of how individual schools run. I, I don't know. Like it's, I'm not underpaid as a teacher because the school that I work for <laughs> undervalues me. Yeah. Right. Like the headmaster is, working like a slave for i don't know thirty thousand dollars a year or something ludicrous yeah. i mean he deserves five times that yeah uh, he does everything he's running carpool in the morning yeah you know he's sending emails out at midnight 
his life would kill me. Uh, and he's, he's earning an absolute pittance. So, you know, it, it's, it's not like he's hoarding all the cash for himself and just paying the teachers not enough right. because he's nasty. <laughs> There's no money. Right. And I, I think you've hit, hit it. We're all just paying kind of as we go for the kids that we have. The parochial school model has kind of fallen mm-hmm. away. I think in our in our own region of California, the only parochial schools that are in existence right now are Seventh Day Adventist and mm-hmm. some Catholic schools. But even then, they they've fallen on hard times. The all girls Catholic school high school just closed several years ago. The Lutheran school closed. So when you have an independent project like Cornerstone, mm-hmm. where you have a lot of different people at at school for a lot of different reasons, Mm -hmm. you're going to have people giving money for a lot of different reasons or not giving money Mm -hmm. or or not able to give money for, for numerous reasons. When our school was first founded, uh, a number of the people were from a very well-known multi-level marketing firm Mm -hmm. and they wanted to promote, you know, great American Christian (laughs) education. And so mm-hmm. there was a tremendous amount of money that went into that. But then slowly as our school started to grow, you know, we had single moms that said, I want this for my kid. Mm-hmm. We had grandparents suddenly finding themselves raising their grandkids. Uh, we had two parent working homes and they're barely scraping by and they're doing all they can to, you know, scrub toilets and be crossing guards so that they can have some, uh, some of their tuition lowered. I don't know how many people actually pay full tuition at our school, but we run on tuition, one fundraiser a year, and then some occasional giving from some generous people. But we don't have a driving force behind us. And many Christian schools, especially as a result of this pandemic, have had to shut down Mm -hmm. because because the amount of funds are not there. The reason that we can even be in existence is God's incredible grace. He must still have work for us to do, so we're doing it. But money is not something that we have in spades. Mm-hmm. And, I, you know, Greg, you probably can share about your last school there. I'd rather not. <laughs> <laughs> or not. Well, yeah. I, I would like to, to jump on to some of the things Samuel has said, because, of course, you're, you're very right in all of these things, but they presuppose some sort of creedal foundation. We all agree that this is the faith, that this is the faith we've lived for, will die for, okay. and will perpetuate into the next generation. That's a hard thing. You mentioned liturgy earlier. Our churches, by and large American churches, are not liturgical. They're not creedal. They're not confessional. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They're fired by the traditions of the past, their own local cultural past. And often that tradition has very little to do with even the basics of the faith. Not to say they don't believe them, Mm -hmm. but that's not what they're all about. They're not about, you say justification by faith, the pastors will get it, the congregation may not, but they will know about worship and the sound system that enables it. (laughs) Um, They will know about their evangelism program and their youth group, even if they can't explain what sanctification is. So, Mm -hmm. as you said, many reasons people come, and for the same reason, they don't donate. The advantage of this, from God's point of view, not ours, (laughs) is that it keeps us honest. We have to please the people right now who we work for. We don't Mm -hmm. become autonomous. We don't get uh, a a huge endowment that will see us for the next three generations while we veer from orthodoxy. Right. You can look at all the seminaries in America's past. They got fat and sassy, and one by one they apostatized. Mm -hmm. So as long as God keeps us committed to the people who are actually paying our salaries, it's hard for us. It is very hard, and it's hard for many of the people who are paying the salaries, but at least they have an immediate voice. If they walk away, we don't have school anymore. Mm -hmm. And we we have the, the liberty and privilege of being upfront and being confessional and saying, look, this is what we stand for. In our own school, we have we have a confession of faith modeled broadly after the Nicene Creed uh, with a little bit of the five solas thrown in. And we can say, these are the things we're going to teach. Uh, other things we're not going to touch. We're not going to talk to your kids about speaking in tongues, although we have our own 
individual views on. We're not going to spend much time with eschatology beyond what the Apostles' Creed says. Mm -hmm. We're not going to hammer on a form of church government, although we will expose your children to all of them historically. Uh, mm -hmm. We will we will have points have them read from the prayer book, although your kids don't have an idea what a prayer book is. Uh, <laughs> you did will... call me a troublemaker in class once because I talked or I asked a question about infant baptism. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> about... that's that's something else we don't talk about. And again, not because I don't have very strong views on the subject, <laughs> but that's not what we're hired to talk about. And besides, if you teach covenant, eventually the kids will figure out most of it anyway, yeah. or at least enough to... <laughs> to deaden any extreme tendencies that are anti-covenantal. There's, there's enough that we agree on that we can teach. And if we're honest and not trying to slip it by the parents, the parents can look at it as like they're looking at a brochure. In fact, in many ways, that's what our website is. It's a brochure that includes the doctrinal statement. And they can say, wow, that's great. I want my kid to learn these things. Others will say, What's all this Trinitarian stuff? We actually had one lady come, this is a great school. My daughter would love to be here. Except could you tone down the Trinity thing? <laughs> no. I don't see why you have to teach that. Uh, we do. We need to go someplace else. Was she an Aryan? <laughs> she was, she was um, United Church. Uh, no, United Pentecostal Church. Um, uh, Sibelian. Um, so it's it's frustrating for us who are on the battlefield, but you know, when you have limited ammunition, limited support, limited funds, you're more inclined not to waste any of the above and to make every shot count. And as I say, it's not I'm not recommending this as a way of life, as anything we would ever choose, <laughs> but it is oftentimes what God has chosen for us. Mm -hmm. And we, but need, I do we need to think, be thankful for that. Right. I do want to pick up on something that Sam said, though, because there's a lot of people out there that... It probably it never even even crossed their mind that they can give to a Christian school, yeah. and that they should. This would be a wise use of their money. Um, mm -hmm. Brian, one of the things that we lack at our school is someone able to do marketing for us because marketing costs a lot of money, oh, and does. often we're we're all doing you know wearing ten different hats, and we don't have someone to go around and you know bang on kettles and ask for people to please give us some money. Which um, is funny. I, I'm just going to point out that you know if you propose to the public at large that, you know, maybe they don't need to give so much money to the local public school. They'll be absolutely right. taken aback. I'm really shocked here that Greg uh. or maybe Sam or even Brian hasn't said that we need to end compulsory education laws to get this thing off the ground. <laughs> I, was, I, was I was wondering why it. we hadn't. <laughs> right. It's like our tax burden is so high that it makes it impossible for people to spend their money yeah. where they want to, even if they very much believe in Christian education. So we're actually talking about a complete dismantling of society here, which... You know. I, I wouldn't have thought there was any point in raising that in this <laughs> conversation. That is the only well, reason we can why I, I thought we were anything. just focusing on positive arguments. For <laughs> uh, yeah, I thought that would have been a, a, made about as much sense as going on a vegan podcast and suggesting that maybe we should, we should eat fewer eggs. <laughs> yes, sign me up for completely dismantling the right. government monopoly on education. Well, I'm hoping that maybe this whole Corona fiasco will might wake people up. Mm -hmm. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> if you I gotta find some wood to knock on. January of 2020, that this year would lower my estimation of unionized public school teachers. <laughs> I would have told you that that was right. impossible. <laughs> oh, that's so low, so low. But I believe that it was at rock bottom, and it. <laughs> It has gone down a lot. <laughs> yeah. I was just going to say, since we... I'm sorry, the dog. <laughs> but since it's we did bring cute. up the uh, the concept of uh, the compulsory payment through taxation, which is theft, um, <laughs> I only 50% mean that. Uh, yeah. Since we brought that up... Uh, it's important, I always think, to be the, the voice that brings a slight bit of nuance. Um, <laughs> I'm not conceited about it at all, as you can tell. But, uh, you know, we, we, we also want to say, while we think that that is a really bloated and inefficient and awful system the way it is, uh, it is set up, and I truly cannot see a way for it to be set up that it would not be that way, mm. it's also not a sin if your children are in public school because of a situational thing, mm -hmm. there's many people who have that financial or single parents, a minimum wage job, 
You know, there's there's a exactly. time when I would have said, you send your kid to a public school, you're in sin. I've grown older and wiser. It's not ideal. And this is exactly where people yeah. in your church should get together yeah, and help right. you around that. But if you go to a church that has no vision for Christian education, yeah. you know, well, we'll change, change Find churches. Find your church. But it would still take, will. But it right. would still take time, yeah. you, even in the best of churches, because it's just... Yeah. You have to fit in. You have to go. You have to grow roots. You have to be long before yep. people are going to come and say, "Hey, let me help you with your kids' education." So yeah. we we acknowledge that, and I appreciate the the um, yeah. the desire to avoid legalism. Mm -hmm. And I think we can do that without at the uh, one at any degree throwing away our basic commitment to this is yeah. the parents' call, and it needs to be informed by the gospel. Mm -hmm. And when we, as a people and as a church, have gotten ourselves into the position like a Daniel, where you are going to babble in you whether you like it or not. It does no good to say, but this is contrary to everything God commands. I would rather die than go through these courses. Daniel didn't do that. Although he, his friends he kissed did the rod. Get, to get thrown into a furnace. Yeah, on a very particular <laughs> issue. But it wasn't yeah, that they right. had to go to a public school. It right. was that they would not follow that public education to its logical conclusion. And that, they, that they brings listened. us back to parents yeah. right mm -hmm. we, those those years where parents are the primary instructors of their children we should never discount them and mm -hmm. i think the church as a whole could do a lot more to instruct parents about the nature of education one of the things that really a lot of people struggled with and which the california teachers association was uh, fighting with here is when we send our kids to school our is the school just a child minder? Are we just sending them there for mm -hmm. daycare that happens to have, you know, some kind of educational benefit? And, mm -hmm. well, you actually act, I think parents have to ask themselves that question, whether their kids are in public school or in, in private Christian school. Are, are, mm -hmm. are exactly. you just, are your kids just being looked after or are they being discipled? And you can mm -hmm. disciple your kids at home uh, in a, by yourself or without going to a Christian school, but it, the nature of the work is different and it's hard. Mm -hmm. And the church has to be there su supporting them in those areas. And that means, well, being there for those families uh, and making sure that education doesn't just mean what happens at school, but it's holistic, you know, mm -hmm. excuse mm -hmm. my cat. No worries. It. <laughs> it's like you can, you can have someone be, a more involved parent when their kids are in public school than a parent whose children go to a private Christian school. Yes. Uh, and that's, that's something that mm -hmm. there's a danger in, I, I think mm -hmm. in either direction, but the particular one is thinking that because you've sent your kid to a private Christian school, that your job is done. Preach, and that you don't need to do yeah. anything else because look, I did the mm -hmm. thing I'm supposed to do. And they're going to take care of it. And yeah, I'll teach them some stuff at home, maybe. Like mm -hmm. how to do chores. <laughs> uh, in that context, Brian, I'd like to give your father a word of commendation. As you heard earlier, Brian comes from a Pentecostal background. And his father was concerned that his son might be corrupted, particularly by me and my Bible <laughs> classes. Um, but we very much wanted Brian to stay around. So we, we made a deal with dad, which was you can come and sit on the Bible classes so you know exactly what your son's being taught. And he came. He came faithfully every single day. Uh, and a few times he contributed, although he wasn't really supposed to say anything. That was part of the deal. But occasionally he <laughs> contributed some really good stuff. Occasionally he, he did. Once or twice he said something a little strange. Uh, but he was there. Every mm -hmm. single day, knowing what mm -hmm. his son was being taught theologically. A whole year, I think. Yeah, it was for the whole year. And mm -hmm. I've been inviting parents for years to come in and sit on my classes and find out what their kids are learning. He was the first one who ever did for any su sustained length of time. Mm -hmm. uh, when he found out that I wasn't the problem. You have Brian hung around with people like David Maxson, who were <laughs> themselves becoming reformed, and that was corrupting everything. So again, and community does matter. The people you hang around <laughs> with, the, the people you influence, right. both your peer group and the older people, are part of this yep. whole yeah. discipline structure, this discipling thing. Well, I, I certainly couldn't. I certainly can sympathize with anyone who can't possibly keep their mouth shut in a Bible class. Even <laughs> cold too. I was going to say, it seems fair. <laughs> I, I do I do absolutely love my father. He is um shall we say an extrovert? 
<laughs> that is putting it mildly. <laughs> <laughs> He's a very, very friendly person. Like I think I've probably met one or two people in my life who are as friendly as wow. Mr. And absolutely committed Christian. Yes. Yes. He's a great guy. Well, no question. You. Yeah. You mentioned um, the job of parents for those first five years. And um, mm-hmm. Laura, you are one of the people yeah. that I think has absolutely wonderfully modeled this. Like I remember coming oh. over to your house to babysit Joy when she was just a toddler and mm-hmm. you were teaching her, you know, the liturgical seasons and the days of the week. And she was just, <laughs> she was learning at, you know, two and three years old. Mm-hmm. And yeah. kids can learn so much if you, like Laura, take the time to teach them. <laughs> and I know we're going to try and not repeat too much of what we said in the last 49 episodes on this particular <laughs> podcast. But one of the things that strikes my memory is uh, how you were talking about uh, Moses's mother yeah. and mm-hmm. how she trained him from youth. She uh, had about before. four years before he slipped into the palace schools. He exactly. had, she, she had completely dedicated time as his nerves, <laughs> but that's what she had. And if she had been the average evangelical mom, she'd still be waiting for him to reach the age of accountability Oof. or yeah. just teaching him, you know, showing him veggie tales or something. Uh, she, she instilled in him a sound grasp of who Je- Jehovah Yahweh really was and yeah. of the promise of Messiah and of the nature of God's covenant with Abraham over against what he was going to encounter in the palace yeah. schools so that mm-hmm. he could understand it and he could survive. Mm-hmm. So those first yeah. years are are absolutely determinative. And to to push yeah. it off and say, well, I'll talk about theology and religion when my kid's old enough to understand. I understand. This is where Kate started. The the child's mm-hmm. in the image of God. That mm-hmm. means he has an a, he she has an immediate relationship with God right now and is already religious, already the image of God in his own particular mm-hmm. way. Mm-hmm. And that needs to be nurtured and and instructed, not ignored. And if we yeah. ignore it, we leave the child to his own sin nature, and that's disastrous. Yeah. Right. I'm I'm curious, Laura, about mm-hmm. your um, every family pursues uh, family devotions in a different mm-hmm. way. I don't know what mm-hmm. you call them, family worship. Mm-hmm. I'm curious to know how your family uh, mm-hmm. did does family worship with your daughter, how that works mm-hmm. into her school schedule too, whether you catechize or mm-hmm. um, every family is different. I feel like that's one of the things that our headmaster always asks is tell me about mm. your family worship time. And he actually can determine quite a lot about a family a from question. our answers. So I'm curious yeah, to know. Yeah. Well, we, it, it has been, um, you know, different as she's grown, but one of the, the great pleasures that I found having a child kind of like you were telling Brian Kate about teaching is, when you start to learn it, when you teach something is when you learn it even more. And so having her be a child and then kind of setting up rhythms um, in earnest, right? Because it, it showed, it helped it show me like, oh yeah, you know, Sam and I should be more regular about praying too. But now we definitely want to be with our child because we want it to be a rhythm that she sees just as regular as, you know, the sunrise and sunset. And so we, I'm trying to think like in the very early years, we always would do prayer time at, at bedtime. I'm trying to think what we, we would do Psalms together. My, my earliest, it became more codified when she was two and we were going to a Lutheran church in Oklahoma and they, um, they gave us a little copy called my hymnal of, of this little, of a little morning and an evening liturgy with, with hymns. And it was just very, um, accessible and doable with her. And so we, we started doing that and, and just kind of singing the same or introducing little songs, you know, learning a handful of songs and then expanding it and, and learning those prayers together. And, um, and then when she got to be three, we would, we would do like a little morning time in the mornings and with like very light, like preschool work. And we would add the morning liturgy from that. And so it just kind of expanded and grew. Um, and so ma- mainly we just do morning office and evening office. And, and now we're at an Anglican church again, and we use, um, Anglican prayer book for those things. Um, 
And I don't know, what, what would you like to add, Sam? Yeah, I mean, we, so we, we have um, uh, in the last couple of years added like a little um, prayer table uh, in our house with um, some like seat colored uh, seasonal altar cloths that we change for the season of the year. So, you know, green at the moment for ordinary time and uh, on important saints days. Well, so we just switched it to the white cloth for all saints day a few days ago. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll go over to the purple cloth for Advent here in a couple of days and so on. And we have candles and little things and, um, various symbols. So like, you know, I, I, I bought a, a bunch of these little animal toys. Um, so like we've got a little lamb and there's a lion and we've got a pelican and like all these little Christian symbols that, um, you know, we've explained to her and we kind of rotate them out depending on what season of the year it is. And it's, there's none, none of these things are are magical and it's in some ways counted to the way I was raised. Um, my, my, uh, dad kind of thinks of himself as a very principled, uh, low church Anabaptist of (laughs) the worst possible kind. Um, (laughs) he doesn't think of himself as being the worst possible kind. Uh, that's what everyone else thinks. Um, but, um, you know, it, I, I, w- I was raised to believe that this kind of uh, liturgical practice by its uh, repetitiousness and its lack of originality was consequently inauthentic um, and, and necessarily. Superstitious. Yeah. yeah, it was, it was superstitious and therefore it, it was, it was unmeant and would be ineffectual. Uh, which is which is just very Wesleyan, and I <laughs> I respect the Wesleys as saints. Um, I, I'm not so sure about the logic of their religious milieu. Um, uh, I think it I think it spends previous generations' capital, uh, and we've now we're we're now out. The bank account is empty. Mm. Um, you can't yep. presuppose that people have a stock of christian idea mm-hmm. and imagination yeah. which you only need to ignite into passionate belief mm-hmm. we are now left only with the passionate belief mm-hmm. and yeah. we have none of the imagination and what does that look like heresy mm-hmm. really <laughs> really no, creative hard heresy. core <laughs> heresy <laughs> um, so you know what that's what we're trying to do is give her a sense of an imagination of the, of the world. So for example, I'll give, I'll give you just mm-hmm. a few anecdotes right before all the lockdown garbage started and, and this endless year turned into the uh, just shower of poo. Uh, <laughs> we went, we went down to Paulie's Island, South Carolina to Synod. Um, and um, our church was being received into the um, diocese formerly as uh, not a missional parish, but a, a full parish in its own right with full standing and membership in the diocese. So we had a whole bunch of us kind of trek down there and just kind of show our faces at, at Synod. Mm-hmm. And uh, before we went, we explained to Joy what we were doing. Now, as far as she was concerned, we were going to stay in a big beach house with a bunch of other families in church who have little kids her age, and we were maybe going to go find some crabs. Right. Like that was what she was in for, which is fine. Um, she did, but you know, we, we took the time to explain to her, you know, when we say the creed that, uh, we believe in the, uh, you know, one true holy Catholic church and the communion of the saints and the resurrection of the dead, the, the, the people that we'll see at this thing are a very small part of what we mean by the communion of the saints. They are some of the other people who believe what we believe and worship the God we worship and are redeemed in, in the same way by the same Savior in this geographic area at this point in time that we live. Yeah. But there's others who live beyond this area, and there's others who are dead, and there's others who are yet to be born. And they're in that too, but we'll see a few of them this weekend. And, and that shapes a child's imagination. Right mm-hmm. now, this isn't a room full of strangers. It's a room full of strangers who are who are this thing. Yeah. Um, 
and it connects to me because I say these words every day. Yeah. Um, and 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 that that's the kind of thing that that we mean by shaping the imagination of a child. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What what is the nature of the world and where do I fit into it? Um, and you, you you have to worship in a way that practices that thing. Uh, and and the the other anecdote that I'll share here, which um, I wouldn't be surprised if Emily's heard it already because it's one of my favorites. But um, uh, uh, it uh, uh, going back to you know what Laura was saying about when we started saying prayers with joy and um, just really being trying to be more conscious of. She'll remember things, and and, and Greg made a quip uh, a little while back about the age of accountability, and, and um, you know, I I I just I just think that's rubbish. Um, uh, you know, this this age of accountability idea, because we all learn things before we understand them. That's right. human nature. Yes. That's right. You learn things, and then you spend the rest of your life trying to understand what you learned mm-hmm. already. Um, and you know. L- liturgy and confessions and stories and everything we learn is is that way you learn mm-hmm. the words and mm-hmm. then you learn what they mean mm-hmm. um and and um I, I this this first came home to me my last summer in hillsdale which was um stressful on no end of levels uh, and i was i was quite miserable emily would tell you that i'm, I'm never exactly uh, you know <laughs> mr jolly Mr. Jolly Sunbeam, um, but even by my own standards, I was I was at a pretty low ebb uh, under a lot of stress and and you know life changes and uh, Laura was working quite a lot and so I, I had a lot of time being at home with Joy, which is not unpleasant. But I was also trying to uh, work on a writing project, which was had become utterly futile. But then I was still wanted to get it finished anyway, and so I was just like totally <laughs> depressed. But you know, one afternoon I'm I'm home with Joy, and you know she's like uh, twenty months old, I think, at this point. Or maybe she just maybe she just turned two, I guess. So she's she's just two, and um, it was it was raining outside. She she said she asked me if we could go outside. And I said, no, Joy, we can't go outside. And she said, she said, why not? And I said, well, it's raining. And, and she said, why? And, I, and I, I said, I don't know. Ask God. And, and she said, bear in mind, we haven't done any work on trying to memorize anything at this point in her life. All yeah. we've done is just go to church every Sunday. She snapped back immediately. Very God of very God, begotten, not made. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. that's the best. Yeah, this this one's listening. Uh, yeah, she's she's learning things. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, there it is. The the Nicene Creed. Comes I'm so to glad it. you told that story because I try not to tell stories about other people's children, but I love that story, and I would yes. have told it despite my rule. <laughs> I'm so glad you did. Um, well, that, story, that yeah. also makes me feel better because I had like a weird. I don't want to call it like a vision because that has connotations, but like this thought where I was like holding my own child and going. Now, God, in all of his essence, is simple. <laughs> and I remember thinking at the time, I was like, okay, I'm, I may not want to start so much uh, complicated stuff right then. But now I'm thinking, you know what? I'll just go with it. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. No, I mean, and that's it, a huge it, mistake it, we make with children. Yeah. We think they're stupid. Yeah. And what they're just, they're just untaught. Mm-hmm. And yeah. they need well, exposure. And the problem is not. The problem is not catechizing your child to memorize complex phrases like that. Mm-hmm. That's not the problem. The problem is never explaining it, exactly. never right. showing what it means mm-hmm. to live it, mm-hmm. and yeah. never teaching them how that thing belongs to them and can be joyful. Mm-hmm. Right? That's, yes. that's the problem. Is mm-hmm. like My father-in-law is always saying, you know, my mother would never answer any of our questions when we were young. She never mm-hmm. answered any of our questions about religion. We would ask her a question and she would always just say, that's just the way it is, right? Mm-hmm. And, and that's, that's the intersection of, of, of parenting and education, right? The, the thing mm-hmm. that a school and a good school and, and a good parent has to do and can never not do, right? The great sin is to answer a question with, that's just the way it is, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. It, you, 
if you have a rule, and this this is our rule, like I I won't enforce any rule that I can't give a positive account of why it's there. Mm-hmm. If I can only explain, if I can only explain the negative of what it is that I that I don't want to have happen, then that needs to change. Either the rule <laughs> is bad or my understanding of it is bad. So because I said so, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay. unless, unless the person who's speaking is God, but then God doesn't have any rules like that either. Right. Like God's God's because I said, so is always yeah. backed by because I'm good. And this thing is good for you. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that, you know, that's the model of rules, you know, like you said, Kate, your 10 commandments in your classroom are the, the, uh, positive applicable versions mm-hmm. of of the the negative instructions right like mm-hmm. uh, right. do not covet your neighbor's wife that that's the negative rule but the positive rule is enjoy your own wife and be happy because mm-hmm. you can if you look at everybody else's wives you'll never have enough right like 10 other people's wives won't make you happy if your problem is you you aren't happy with your own wife right, right. the positive is you know love your wife and then maybe she'll stop griping at you because you, you, know, you might find out that the real problem is that you're an ass. Um, you know. There's so, sanctification there. Exactly. Um, you know, so it, yeah, it, 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 that's where you start, Brian is, is, is you, you teach him these things, you expose them to all these words. Um, and, uh, you know, that joy, um, you know, partly it's just, um, it, she's she's inherited her propensity to follow rules from from Laura. That's that's the other side of the family. My side of the family doesn't follow rules, but uh, she she's she's inherited a, 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 a interest in words from my side of the family. Not that Laura's family doesn't isn't you know right. is not bookish, but with my side of the family is very wordy people, and um, you know she loves words. She plays with them all the time. Whenever she learns a new synonym. She'll, we sometimes we even hear her uh, in the other room just like playing around <laughs> with words. I yeah. forget, she was maybe three one time when Laura overheard her going back and forth with a word that Laura and I pronounced differently. I can't remember which one it was now. <laughs> oh. What was it? It's probably like can't, can't. I think uh, it was something like that. It, it, like, you know, <laughs> tomato, tomato, or whatever. Yeah. Um, she was just like going back and forth saying it the English and the, and the American way. <laughs> Um, and she's just always been that way, playing with words. And um, part of the reason is um, we uh, we don't let her watch a, a lot of TV. We, we don't. Have, she watches maybe a, a show or, or two a day, but um, we've always let her listen to as many audio books as she likes. And she has a little Bluetooth speaker that she just totes around listening to these, <laughs> these books endlessly. Yes. Hour, and she'll listen to the same one, you know, five times mm-hmm. in a row. And yeah. she's got them, you know, memorized. Mm-hmm. And um, But she then, I actually taught her to read, which makes it sounds like I'm, I'm, I'm amazing. But I just used a phonics book. I used to you know, <laughs> teach a child to read in 100 Simple Lessons phonics book. Right. It's great. Good. Um, <laughs> and um, so I, I, you know, I, I, literally watched her learning to read because I was, I was facilitating that. And, um, I, you know, when a, when a little kid is concentrating on something, you can see it on their face. It's, it's like shifting through gears to yeah. find the one that works. They're like, <laughs> and then they get it. Right? And, uh, when she was, she's looking at these words and like sounding them out and trying to figure out what these letters, what word they make. And, she she could get there so much more quickly than other kids would because she'd heard the words before mm. right she knew the word mm-hmm. now she's learning to read it and she's also kind of learning fully what it means um yeah. and you know i i lose count of how many times i've told my students this over the years but one of the phrases that i repeat more often than any other is words are vessels that contain ideas and the more words you have in your brain the more ideas you'll keep there if you have a a poor vocab words will go through your brain like a rainstorm over a desert and when the rain is gone you your brain will still be barren because you can't keep any of them there but if you have a strong vocabulary you'll be able to 
keep all these words and you'll be able to keep all the ideas that go with them, right? And and the Augsburg Confession is just that, right? It's words that describe a God whose essence is ineffable and yet complex, you know, not complex. It's without parts and simple. What does that mean? It, it it means something so sublime that you, that we can't actually reduce it to human words. The the best form of words we can ever come up with will only do part of the job, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, waiting until people can fully comprehend it to teach them the words that we use to try to comprehend it is a fool's errand because none yeah. of us can comprehend it. So you start with the words that we have yeah. once they've memorized them then they can learn. Yeah. One of the things that um, our, our church pro- uses is the Heidelberg Catechism. Mm-hmm. And our daughter, our first daughter, was, had a steel trap memory. And I, she was four when she memorized the first answer to the first mm-hmm. ho- question of the Heidelberg Catechism, what's your only comfort in life and death? And it's a mm-hmm. fairly long catechism question. <laughs> it is. Mm-hmm. And, the, and she probably didn't understand most of the words that were in there. And we actually require um, our, ch- our children as they're being catechized to memorize this catechism about three times over before they get to the age of about 14 or so when they generally may- are making a public profession of faith and after confirmation, mm-hmm. but they don't understand the big words, righteousness, they don't understand mm-hmm. sanctification. They don't. Mm-hmm. These are words that they hear frequently, but they we often don't stop and take time to explain them. I know yeah. that's true because I see the kids that come into my classroom and I ask them what is righteousness, and uh, I can tell them every week, and they won't get it right. And uh, one year I put that question on every Bible test the whole year, and I said it's going to appear until everybody in this class gets it right. You must memorize <laughs> this definition. And uh, they were frustrated, but they all that class all knew what it meant. <laughs> and um, I think what you said is so profound because kids need to have all they need to have pegs on which to hang their knowledge, mm-hmm. and that primarily comes through repetition. It comes through memorization. It comes mm-hmm. through reading to your children and not keeping, not not saying, well, I'm going to give you this uh, junior version of a Bible. Yeah. You know, we when we did family devotions with our children, we did not read a children's Bible. Mm-hmm. We read the Bible. And when our oldest daughter was two, Greg was reading the story, the account of Abraham. And sometimes we could get like maybe four or five verses before she was just like, okay, she's done. Mm -hmm. But she got to to Abraham's death. I don't know if you've told the story in the podcast, Greg, but Abraham in the story died Mm -hmm. and Emily broke down. She was Uh, uncontrollably sobbing. My my Emily. Uh, Uh, Greg, what's going on, honey? Abraham uh, died. She's two and a half. She, re- she understood something about her friend, Abraham, that was dead. And yeah. it was because we were just reading. Now, how many children's stories include a death of a character? Right. You know, right. Abraham and he died. No, it was, yeah. uh, they don't. Okay. They, they just don't. <laughs> or if they include death, they make it something cute. Like, you know, the death of the world and the flood. Yeah. where it's a very <laughs> cute story yeah. well yeah uh, joy joy's bedtime story today was beetle the bards um the warlock with the, hoary, <laughs> with the hairy heart, hairy heart. So, um, that's, that's pretty amazing. brutal <laughs> right right we, we definitely don't be cut that stuff out of kids stories yeah and yeah it's like when we when we take these things and we we try to say okay you know this is something that they're not ready for uh, especially like you were saying, th- these these words that we use to try and under sorry you meaning Sam uh, <laughs> these words that we use to try and describe what we know of God from Scripture that mm-hmm. doesn't even give us the whole picture. It's presumptuous of us to say, "Well, I know what that means, and therefore." I will give you the kids version that you could understand at that age, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but you'll get the full version that I understand later. 
Uh, mm. How does that not translate into some kind of weird Gnosticism where we have this mm. magical <laughs> we need power a bell over these for words? Every time we mention Gnosticism, it on wasn't the show, me this time. Every it time. wasn't me. Gnosticism right, so comes I have this secret week. knowledge, and I can't share it with you yet. Uh, yeah. These things in Scripture uh, are for our children too, and church, mm. and what we yeah. experience in church is for our children too, and yeah. and. I, I could go on for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we could all go on for a long time, and we, in fact, already, already have. have <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, I think we should sign off. Um, typically, at the end of every show, we give a recommendation of a book or a movie or an activity of some sort that you recommend for our listeners. Mm -hmm. So I think we should do that and then sign off. So, Brian, are you ready with your recommendation like you always are? One of my favorite, I'm going to try and keep this short. One of my favorite cuisines is Indian food, and it is expensive sometimes, or can be, uh, especially if you want it fresh, because they do like the buffet stuff during lunchtime some of the time, but it's just been sitting out and it's just not as good. <laughs> um, and so I learned how to make my favorite Indian dish, which is butter chicken. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to recommend butter chicken. I will send so emily good. the link to put it in our show notes and yeah. there's a couple weird like ingredients that you probably won't find at your local grocery store you may need to like order it off of amazon or find <laughs> a, a an indian market near you like i did and but it's very good it's very rich and very flavorful you like marinate the chicken in herbs and uh greek yogurt overnight and it mm -hmm. just makes it so soft and delicious. So I'm recommending food yeah. this time. It's very <laughs> non-intellectual, but God made chicken and he made yeah. spices. And <laughs> for his own his, glory. For his own yes. glory. <laughs> Amen to that. All right. We're going to go clockwise from my screen. So Kate, you're next. I'm going to recommend um, one of my favorite bloggers and uh, a book that he's written. His blog is the title of the book. And I don't know, Emily, if you read this when you were working at Cornerstone that one year, but and his the, the blog is called Smart Classroom Management. And mm -hmm. the author is Michael Linson. He's a public school teacher in San Diego. And he has some incredible insights on, cre on classroom discipline and management. Mm -hmm. And a uh, funny story, my, my, uh, supervisor and I share his blogs and his emails back and forth because we get so much out of it for how we manage our classrooms. And we swear, we just swear that this guy is a Christian because <laughs> sometimes he'll slide, slip in some comments and you're just like, no one in their right mind who's not a Christian would say anything that kooky, right? <laughs> uh, or use that kind of language. And so one day my, my supervisor was emailing me and to say, did you read that last post? Did you catch that line? Now I'm sure he's a Christian. She thought she was emailing me. She actually emailed him. <laughs> and, and he responded back and said, you got me. Secrets out. <laughs> because, you know, he, ha he has a very professional, you know, he needs to be as accessible to people as he can and not be written off. So Smart Classroom Management by Michael Linson and Laura. Mm -hmm. He has an excellent little sub uh, additional booklet on teachers who teach breakout classes, including oh. music, which you might be interested in. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Greg, you're next. I'm going to recommend the Book of Common Prayer because <laughs> yeah. uh, in, in honor of our guests, um, <laughs> because well, it was originally created to teach God's people how to pray in public worship after years of not being allowed to do so. Mm -hmm. And we could use those lessons again, but as um, Samuel said, uh, there there is a positive good and joy and uh, disciplinary side to the repetition Sunday after Sunday of the same sorts of things. We do not need to be afraid of it. Uh, I'm going to take a couple minutes and add my own little anecdote. <laughs> we were talking about this kind of thing with my students in terms of marriage vows, people wanting to write their own vows. I would just <laughs> yeah. as soon use the vows from the Book of Common Prayer any day. Um, and they, my kids weren't seeming to get it and said, okay, guys, who, who here 
could come up with an acceptable a marriage vow that would be acceptable to any of these young ladies. And they all stared at me in fear. And finally, one young man got up and said, um, um, hey, babe, you, me? That ended the idea, I think, for all of them of ever writing their own vows <laughs> better than what their pastor was doing. That's true. Uh, That's brilliant. We, we are taught by the traditional words. And, and you, Kate, yeah. you were listening to things that, that Sam had been talking about, of pegs to hand things on, but to take it back to what he originally said, liturgy is key here. Mm -hmm. What do our children hear Sunday after Sunday? And in home yeah. liturgies, what do they hear over and over and over again? Yeah. Those are pegs. Those are words. Those are markers. Those are things. And so even if you're not Anglican or Episcopalian or whatever, pick, get a copy, read it, preferably the oldest or older versions mm -hmm, mm -hmm. from Elizabeth's time or maybe even further back, um, mm -hmm. and, and experience what another tradition, um, mm -hmm. how they do worship and find the beauty in it. So there's, there's mine. Yeah, it, it, might, it might tie a few... Uh passing side comments that I've yeah. made in this podcast together to note that my parents and my dad wrote their own marriage vows. <laughs> um, I've never read them. He only told me that they'd done that. I, I'm sure they're crap. Uh, but, uh, no one in the English language has come up with or could come up with anything better than everything I have I give unto the richer, poorer, sickness, yes. health, uh, <laughs> worse until death us do part uh, it's uh yeah yeah oh, man. awesome Great. laura okay i will recommend um well quick question are will this podcast come out soon or like is it a few like uh middle of december middle of december okay yeah. um in that Christmas case <laughs> no you just have I'll, made two fab I fabulous did. smelling and tasting Christmas puddings, so we could uh, side recommend that. homemade Christmas pud <laughs> <laughs> for your own Dickensian Christmas pleasure. That's mm. right. Drink with hot gin. And I will say they they hot gin. they taste better than any of the store bought ones. Like I think I might actually be a convert. I mainly I mainly do it for Sam, but I was like, wow, this is actually good. So making it yourself makes a difference. Um, I, I was going to say though. Um, like small children catechesis and, and is kind of like a, a biggest, my biggest passion. So I'll recommend since it's, since it's coming out right before Christmas time, my, one of my all time favorite Christmas um, picture books, which is appropriate for all ages, but it's um, the clown of God by Tommy DePaula. And also because we were talking about reading children's books in which characters die. Um, <laughs> this is, <laughs> It it's um a book that I've been reading to to Joy since she was really very small and it's you know it he didn't come up with the story right he's kind of rewriting this legend and so beautiful and you know, the art is beautiful the story is beautiful um and I love just relish reading it at Christmas time and really entering into that mystery of Christ and the incarnation and what what we offer what we have to offer like what can we offer and it's really really beautiful so yeah that's my recommendation great sam um all right i'm i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna be a classic academic and you asked me to recommend one thing i'm, I'm going to recommend three things in <laughs> declining order from the sublime to the ridiculous one of the pleasures of being involved in the classical education movement uh, especially for those of us who were educated in really rubbish state schools based on progressive philosophy is that you get to teach you 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 can know that you're giving your students something that's better than what you had and you go back and you learn the things that you wish you'd been offered the opportunity to learn when you were young um and so you kind of get to read all these things that people probably think you've read already that you actually haven't um so uh like many classical school teachers i have to work uh, a second job to be able to afford to live uh, and so unfortunately i don't have time right now in my life for reading anything other than what i'm reading in class 
fortunately, the stuff that I'm reading in class is terrific. So <laughs> that's good. I'm reading good stuff. It's just the same stuff that my students are reading. Um, so in my classical studies class right now, we're working our way through uh, Sophocles. Theban plays his, his uh, Oedipus cycle. Hmm. And um, yeah, uh, you know, mm. if you if you haven't read them, read them. If you've if you've read them, read them again. Uh, especially <laughs> at this moment in time, um, Antigone, the tension between Antigone as this extreme kind of anti-state diehard, like you know, Antigone is she all my tendencies are in antigone's direction <laughs> like just to just to take a, a fatal stand on identitarian principles that just like this thing that i am is stupid and i'm gonna die to spite you <laughs> damn it kill me now you authoritarian bastard um, that's like i that's that's what i am um and uh, so the, then, like Creon is, he's you know, we need government, we need we need laws, and sometimes they have to punish people who are troublesome to the to the polity. So um, you know, it, it's 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 a, a a timeless play, and that's what makes a classic, right? It speaks to the human condition, and it always will. So yeah, Sophocles, Antigone. One of the things we've we, I've done this year um, more than more than ever is to change my consumption of news from mm. daily um, anything anything daily to be exclusively monthly and weekly periodicals. Um, I read magazines. We we take a bunch of magazine subscriptions, mm. um, and I don't listen to or watch or consume the daily news. So. For example, a certain American politician who won't be named, who's the sound of whose voice is very annoying and the things that he says are very annoying. I don't hear them because I don't hear anything. I just read about them afterwards, which is annoying enough. Um, and so, you know, turn off the television, turn off the radio and read a magazine. Uh, and lastly, I strongly recommend not cheering for Derby County Football Club. Oh. <laughs> and if you don't know what that is, that's good for you. Don't Google yes. it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. I think I'm going to recommend Pippi Longstocking. Um, I actually <laughs> bought the anthology, like the nice one volume, in order I to give know. to my dentist um long story what? <laughs> what? um okay so if you're a dentist a child i didn't think you were that hard <laughs> does he have long red braids <laughs> no so um some of you may know this about me i don't manage medical situations very well i tend to internalize stress and then when it's too much for me, I either burst into tears or pass out. I can um, attest to that. That's happened yes, in my office. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. And so uh, I was having wisdom teeth out this summer, Ooh. and uh, it did not go well. Um, I have had wisdom teeth extractions go well. This one didn't. Um, and so I had brought with me, knowing that I was probably going to have a hard time, I'd brought with me some children's book because I was like I need the lightest fluffiest thing I think it was like a Betsy Tacey book or something <laughs> and the dentist saw this and when I start to you know tear up and have a hard time she's like so when I came to America when I was 10 years old I would read Encyclopedia Brown and Pippi Longstocking your hair is red like Pippi Longstocking and that was just like the <laughs> angle she took to try and comfort me and I just appreciated her so much that I went and bought this anthology of Pippi Longstocking to give to my dentist. The problem is with coronavirus and everything, I haven't been able to give it to her. And now that's several months ago. So uh -huh. now it's just awkward. And I have this, <laughs> this book of Pippi Longstocking in my house. Um, so I might just give it to someone else because probably she doesn't remember me by now. But anyway, they're great, wonderful children's books. Um, a Swedish American author, I believe. Um, just fun, just real fun. 
I think yeah. her her father is the king of the cannibals in the South Seas. That's right. Um, which is the kind of stuff you can't put in children's books anymore. Right. <laughs> right. No. That's, that's... You mean you mean the authors, right? Oh yes. <laughs> no, no, Pippi Longstocking. She has a, a horse that lives in her house, also, which I think would be really <laughs> messy. But she's um, also a ten year old girl who lives in a house on her own, which is uh, yep. frowned upon these days. So <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Probably was always frowned upon, actually. (laughs) Yeah. Anyway, so thank you so much, all of you, for being here. I've had a delightful time. I hope you have as well. This is. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Oh, it's fun. It's really nice to meet you, Laura and Sam. Yes, Yes, you too, Kate and Craig and Brian. Hope we can do this. If you ever want to come to California, we have a great school. (laughs) (laughs) I just saw the the hiring, but we always are looking for people for a second. Not even close. Thousand yard <laughs> stare. Not <Just> a <laughs> chance. <laughs> Never say those things around God. <laughs> That's true. That's All true. right. Thank you so much uh, to our listeners. Thanks for tuning in. Hope you've enjoyed this special podcast, our celebration number 50. We've been doing this for like a whole year now, which is <laughs> kind of incredible um, considering my state of organization. Anyway. Um, yeah thanks for listening thanks also to our financial supporters if you'd like to join their number you can go to our website anchor.fm slash halting towards zion um you can still find our podcast anywhere you listen to podcasts on apple Podcasts. they don't call it itunes anymore right um google podcasts spotify etc uh you can send us an email let us know your thoughts halting towards zion at gmail.com we look forward to hearing from you